Well, today's message is called preparing for marriage. And it, it may sound like, you know, well, shouldn't you be giving that to like the singles group or the college and career group or something like that? And here at New Hope Central Wahoo, our value is that the whole church come online and understand these principles. So parents know it. So certainly all the youth, you know, they hear this. The parents will know it too, but uncles and aunties and uh, cousins and everyone, grandma and grandpa, we're all on the same page together. Because in, in order for our young people to succeed, and by the way, you know what's really cool was, uh, as I was looking up, you know, uh, genetics, genetics um, on YouTube, I discovered that last September, she got married. Yeah, so she actually got married. There's a YouTube video of her, um, and it says, I waited for you. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so it's kind of, it's pretty cool how the, the Lord just kind of brought that full circle. Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, but in order for us to uh, succeed, it, it, it has to be the whole church in, in the same, on the same page. Amen? The, the whole church has to have the same culture. So mom and dad need to read off the same piece of music. Now understand, you know, that that's not always possible. Um, that uh, um, sometimes like our, our, our spouses are not even in, in fellowship in church with us. So... Uh, this, is, this is something that we're contending for, amen, that we're contending for. This is the conversation that we can have. So this is, is going to be an interesting conversation that you can have with uh, young people uh, as you're talking with them, as they are thinking about, like, you know, one of the most important decisions they will ever make after coming to Jesus, the most important decision they'll ever make is who they're going to marry, amen? How many of us would agree? Yeah. So that's worth like some serious prayer, discussion. Let's look at the Bible. Let's look at this very, very carefully. And let's not like just rush into something just because, you know, we feel our biological clock ticking or whatever it is. I love that line. Why am I concerned about my biological clock when I serve the author of time? That's pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. All right. So this is all part of our um, explicit series. And remember we said that explicit doesn't mean naughty, nasty, or anything like that. It means to be clear, detailed, and leaving no room for confusion or doubt. So if after today's message there is still some confusion or doubt, talk to me afterwards and, and we'll try to dispel those, all right? Now, families, if you notice, uh, family is not something... We get to choose when we're little, right? For the most part, families are chosen for us. It's not something that we have control over. So when we're born, it's not like you can get a catalog and say, hmm, this looks like a good family. I'd like, I'd like to be in that family, you know, or, uh, you know, or uh, I'd like to live in, uh, you know, like in, I don't know, um, Southern California. So I'll choose this family over here. It's, it, it doesn't work that way. It's not like you can thumb through a catalog like you're picking the drapes. So we come to this world and God places us in a family. So family is God's design, God's plan. And while we may not always understand his reasons for putting us in our family, we do know that things work best when you follow his plan. Right? So let's, let's go with the plan. And uh, once upon a time, uh, I was, you know, a single guy and I was trying to, you know, get into a relationship and, you know, that sort of thing. And got a picture of, of me here. Uh, there we are there. So that, that is the, uh, that's the lovely bride there, my, my wife, Mona. And um, yes, she once upon a time dated Mackie Fury. <laughs> I don't know what, what I was thinking. Uh, but hey, that was cool in the 70s, you know. Actually, that's about 1981, so that's 34 years ago, and I'm sporting the, uh, the mid-comb and the uh, stash. Um, but, um, you know, after, and, you know, I, I will be totally upfront with you, after a, a couple of relationships that did not work out very well, um, a long time ago, 
I tried to like ask the Lord and just like, like come before him and say, Lord, how does this work exactly? How do you, how do you, we go from uh, being a Christian single person to a Christian married person and not compromise your word, not compromise morality, not compromise. How do we do that? And um, this is like towards the end of my journey on that because it took a long time. So I'm about 23 here, you know, 24-ish. But, um, you know, my Filipino Playboy year started when I was in first grade. So <laughs> it was, it was not, not a good thing. It was not a good thing, um, you know, growing up Filipino and um, trying to figure this out. So I, I finally realized that my focus was, was all wrong because I was, I was looking for Miss Wright, right? But I, I realized that I had to stop looking for Miss Wright. So after several broken relationships, I decided that's it. I, I'm, I'm done. This was around college time. I said, this is, this is not, not good. Not good for my spiritual life. Not good for my relationship with God. So I decided I'm no longer going to like pursue Miss Wright. And I just figured this one out on my own. I just like read, I'm reading stuff. And, and instead, my whole thing was to try to become Mr. Wright. So I, I wanted to ask the Lord to help me to become the kind of person, because I realized in all those other broken relationships that, you know, that didn't go well, I was the problem. I, me, I was the problem. I was the one being selfish. I was the one just, uh, you know, like, you're, you exist to make me happy, that kind of thing, right? Now, how many of us know you bring that into a marriage relationship, you are going to be a very, very sad person, Right? You're in a marriage relationship, and your whole thing is you, you, you exist to make me happy. So as we learned a couple of weeks ago, the purpose of marriage is not first happiness. It is holiness. And only, only the people of God are going to get that. The world is never going to understand that. And what we're saying, what we're saying with that is this, that when things go badly... That's because I make them go badly. I'm, I am the reason they go badly. The problem is not her. The problem is me. The problem is not out there. The problem is in here. Amen? So it is the world that would say, you notice this? It's the world that says, and you're going to learn more about this next week. I'm kind of giving away next week's message a little bit. But I'll give you a little, uh, just a little bit of uh, um, a preview. The world will say that the problem is out there, that the problem is global warming, or the problem is, you know, um, terrorism. Uh, the problem is out there. It's out there, okay? But how many of us know the problem is really in here? Yeah, and only religious people, only, only people who actually read the Word of God will understand, for I have sinned. I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so the first thing we had to do is this guy had to learn that he needed to become Mr. Right. Now, did I ever become perfectly Mr. Right? No. But um, uh, it was awesome. It was awesome to go through this journey of saying, I'm going to stop looking for Miss Right and I'm going to be very intent and, and get really serious about my own spiritual growth. And so I want to say that as like the first thing that we tell our young people, the first thing that we tell our children, and that is do, do not look for a relationship. Instead, you need to become a person that someone, in fact, ask, ask that question. You know, I, I ask this to my 16-year-old sometimes, you know, because he gets weird <laughs> every now and then, freaks out, you know. And, and we just have this conversation. So you... One of these days you want to be in a relationship, yeah? Well, ask yourself this question. Would anyone want to marry you? In fact, would you like to marry you? <laughs> would you want to marry someone like you? That is a huge revelation for a person. If the answer is like, 
uh, <laughs> no. Okay, well then you become the person that someone would like to marry. And who is every Christian girl's dream? Marrying someone like Jesus, right? Like what genetics was saying, when I, when I see you, I will see the wisdom of Solomon in you. You know, I will see the leadership of Moses, and I will see the faith of Abraham. I'll tell you, you know, um, the world, you know, they marry for the weirdest reasons, right? They'll, they'll look for someone who's like got the hottest moves on the dance floor or got the nicest car or got the most money or something like that, right? But when you are intent on becoming the person that Jesus wants you to be, what is actually sexy is like, look, you know, it's like doing your devotions and becoming a person with like amazing character. Um, uh, someone who is like responsible and disciplined. Uh, someone whose words are laced with the Holy Spirit, full of love and joy and peace and patience. That's sexy to a Christian single girl. <laughs> pretty awesome, huh? Isn't that pretty awesome? Yeah, so anyway, that's how I got her. <laughs> um, I, was, I was not, I, I stopped looking, like I said. And uh, in fact, the, the guy who was mentoring me said, Mike, do not get into a relationship for a, for a whole year. You just focus on the Lord and focus on your ministry. And I said, I, I accept that challenge. I am Filipino, but I accept the challenge anyway. <laughs> I can do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, so I did that. Can you imagine that? A Filipino guy? No relationship for a whole year? That was, a, that was a miracle. But I was like focused on Jesus, focused on reaching people for Jesus, just focused on building the ministry. And then after a year, that same mentor came to me, brought me into his office, and he said, Mike, you're ready. You should pursue a relationship now. I got the green light. <laughs> and I said, oh, praise God, hallelujah. And, and then me and this mentor and a group of friends did it intentionally. We did this very, very intentionally. So um, when I started to, um, you know, uh, go out with uh, Mona over there, right, the lovely Mona, we first went out, and, uh, and this is like, uh, you know, um, the first time that I wanted to communicate with her, this is like very, very early on in a relationship, and I wanted to communicate with her that uh, I wanted to get to know her for the purpose of, of marrying her. Now, this is like on a date, right? And I said, I said that to her. I remember like in a car, we were talking, and I said, Mona, I just wanted you to know that um, my, my intention for our relationship is to get to know you for the purpose of marrying you. Now, that's not a proposal. I'm just saying that I, I wanted you to know what my intentions are in this relationship. I'm, I'm not just like socializing. And she was drinking a cup of coffee and she <laughs> You, you what? <laughs> it wasn't exactly like that, but it was kind of like that. She was like, taken aback a little bit. She was like, okay, I've never been in a relationship with a guy that was like that, like clear about his intentions. And at first, I tell you that she was shocked. But then, after she thought about it, she was grateful. She appreciated it. Because, you know, I mean, take, take one look. You, you, you know I'm not the first guy to try to, you know, uh, pursue her in a relationship, right? So she said, no one's ever said that to me before. And, you know, and, and that requires real leadership, honesty. That requires uh, real maturity. And she really liked that. She thought that was pretty awesome. And so we went and talked with my mentor, Right? And um, he gave us a couple of books that were called Before You Say I Do. And I, we had not even proposed. 
No proposal yet. No proposal. Right? I hadn't got down on one knee, you know, and said, you know, would you marry me? We were, we were just exploring this possibility intentionally, prayerfully, under the supervision of a mentor. And I, and I wanted to just to kind of throw that out there because, the, you know, the way the world does it today is like, it, it, it's sad, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's hook up, shack up, break up, repeat, right? Hook up, shack up, break up, repeat. And, and unfortunately, that is what's going to happen if you don't do it God's way, right? I, I'm, just talk, I'm talking about probabilities, obviously. There are a lot of people that make it through somehow, but I'd say if you look at society, society's gone crazy, right? I look at this past week, right? <laughs> I look at Bruce Jenner, you know, and I, I'm thinking society has gone completely insane. And so I'm looking for a place, I'm looking for a community, I'm looking for a, a group of people where we can like actually do biblical life with, amen? Like do spiritual life with, just separate from all the craziness that's out there. And, um, and this, so this is what we did. It was very intentional. It was very prayerful. And, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, consent, you know, from the both of us. She, she caught on to the vision. And so here we are um, this coming summer, uh, July 30th. We will be um, celebrating our 32nd anniversary, wedding anniversary. So that's next month. Next month. So you, the first thing you do is you become Mr. Right. You just set aside all thoughts of a relationship. Do not think about getting a relationship. You just become Mr. Right. Or, or if, obviously you're a sister. You become Miss Right. Okay? And then you prayerfully with counsel and under discipleship and um, with your spiritual leaders. And if you have godly parents, involve them as well. And you say, can we pray about Miss Wright? You know, can we pray about who that is? And, um, and so what I did was I, you know, went into my mentor's office again. You know, I had this sit-down conversation. I said, well, he asked me, um, are you interested in anyone? You know? And I said, yeah, I got kind of a top five. <laughs> You know, I mean, because I, I fully didn't expect that, you know, everyone would say yes. <laughs> I figure, you know. So, you know, just in case, you know, you don't, you know, the first four don't work out. Of course, you don't tell them that. <laughs> um, I won't tell you what number she was. No, <laughs> she's number one. No. But, uh, yeah, you know, uh, we talked about it. That's the point. We talked about, you know, who. And what was neat was to be in, in a fellowship where everyone had that value, everyone had that um, uh, vision, you know, to try and um, uh, be this person that was going to wait for the right person. So I want to encourage you. Um, I know that we're probably all over the place, you know, in terms of trying to figure this out, but I, I'm kind of th throwing out like a, a vision for how we can have this conversation with our young people going forward. And, and let me just say, that's very important. That's a very important point. And that is that how many of us, we, we, we come to church and we're pretty hammered, right? I, mean, I don't mean drunk or smashed, but, <laughs> but I mean, you know, just hammered by the world, you know. Um, and uh, when, we, when, we're, when we come into the, to the, to the church, all kinds of stuff has happened already. There's all kinds of issues, you know, a lot of mistakes made. And praise, praise Jesus, he has grace for, for us in that. And so, we come together this morning with a brand new start. Amen? So, whatever the mistakes were made in the past, the Lord gives you a brand new beginning right now. So, praise God. It's never too late to start again. And that's what we're doing. So, okay, so we get that. Let's kind of just understand a little bit <clears throat> about relationships and, um, and then uh, just kind of lay a, a kind of a foundation. We're going to talk about, obviously, how to um, become a person who is ready for marriage. And, um, 
The Bible, I think, gives us a really excellent outline for the design for marriage, which will lead to blessing. Now, it's not uncommon for creators, right, to hide themselves in their creations. So, it's commonly believed that Leonardo da Vinci painted himself in the Mona Lisa. So, so that, that might be Leonardo's, you know, Caitlin moment. I'm not sure. I don't, <laughs> I don't you know. Just, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> that's, one, that's one thing. But, uh, and how many of us know, you know, Peter Jackson? He puts himself as a cameo in his, in his own movies, like, you know, in Lord of the Rings, right? And uh, the, 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 the creator of the Marvel Universe, Stan Lee, always puts himself in every Marvel film. So in the same way, when we look at marriage, we see the fingerprints of God. We see a cameo of God in marriage. When we look at God, we get a closer sense of what marriage is intended to be. Write in your notes, we are made in the image of a relational God who designed us for perfect relationship. We're made in the image of a relational God who designed us for perfect relationship. Now, obviously, we can have wonderful relationships outside of marriage. It doesn't have to be, you know, sexual. Um, you can have wonderful, loving friendships. And I, I would say that is, like, really key even before you get into, like, a, a serious marriage relationship. But the Bible tells us that God in his very being, right, is relational. He is simultaneously, and this is, we're talking about one God as Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one God. Each in a perfect, loving relationship with the other. He doesn't just relate. He is, in his very being, a relationship. The nature of God is relationship. And then it says in Genesis 1.27, let's read it together. Got it there? Ready? Go. So God created mankind in his own image. Okay, now hang on for a second. In his own image. Meaning that we were made in the image of this God who is relationship. Right. Right. So, continue. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Now, just underline that phrase, very good. Just underline it for now. I want to come back to that. Now, God, who is himself a relationship, created human beings. And human beings are made for what? Relationship. Oh, we intensely want to be in relationship. We cannot stand to be alone. We have this thing in us, it's called loneliness, that is so powerful. It is incredibly powerful. We will not, we will not stand for it. We do not want to be alone. And sometimes, unfortunately, it will drive us to do wrong things to try and get rid of that feeling. But just, I just want you to know that this is part of our design. Okay? In fact, I want you to see this. Before Eve came into the picture, there was this very interesting phenomena that existed in the Garden of Eden. Adam was made in the image of a relational God, and yet he was by himself. Right? So Adam, who's made in the image of a relational God, stands alone. Now he's got the animals, you know, and he's really grateful for the animals. <laughs> but something's not right. And God observes this phenomenon in Genesis 2.18. Now this is God. Now remember, there's no sin in the world, right? The world is a perfect place. And yet, God says this. Ready? Go. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. 
I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, underline that phrase, not good. Now, this is a very interesting phenomenon that's happening here. It's, this is an interesting situation. No sin has occurred in the Garden of Eden. There is no evil here. The fact that Adam is alone is not evil. It is just not good. That makes sense? So, in other words, the fact that God created Adam in the image of God is amazing. And when God did that, he said that was very good. But now that he sees Adam is alone, God says, not good. Now, we need to see just how profound this is. Because the fact that um, <clears throat> we want to be in a relationship, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you intrinsically. It is part of our design. It is part of our design to, to long to be in a relationship with, with other human beings. And ultimately, to be married. Now, for some, um, they, they do not get married. Jesus didn't get married. Paul didn't get married. Now, did they live very fulfilling lives? Absolutely, because of their relationship with God. But there's this one dimension of their life, one, one dimension of our lives, which, will, which, which can only, both, unless you have that gift that Jesus and, and Paul had, right? It's called celibacy. This, this, this one area of our life will not be fulfilled, listen, even by a perfect relationship with God. I want you to think about that. Adam had not sinned. Adam is in a perfect relationship with God, and yet he feels the loneliness. That's profound. That means that we are, that we are designed for relationship. This is huge. It's important to understand this about ourselves because if we don't understand it, we'll, we'll feel like, gosh, there's something wrong with me. Like, you know, I'm such a loser or uh, what's wrong? Why do I feel so... We were made, designed by God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to exist in a family, to be part of a family. And so, praise God, we have a church family, amen, for all of us. And then, for others of us, there's going to be that certain calling to be in a marriage relationship. For others, there'll be a calling to celibacy, that, and that's where God sets you aside strictly for him. And, and by the way, all of us, for a season in our life, we, had to, we have to go through that. Okay? So all of us, for a season in our life, you will be called to, to, to just Jesus. That's what I didn't figure out. And then, until, and then when I figured that out, then the Lord said, all right, you, you did it. <laughs> you had that season of like, just completely focused on me. That's what I wanted you to, to, to get. Now, once you get that, now you can enter into a relationship. And listen, when you enter into that relationship, you're going to be a healthy part of that relationship, not unhealthy. Does that make sense? Because you understand that God has to be supreme in your life. If you didn't get that part, then you go into a relationship, and now you think that your spouse is the one that's supposed to meet all your needs. Now, what happens when you put it on another person, another human being, to meet all the needs in your soul? You're going to destroy that person. You will destroy that person. No human being can meet, satisfy, and fulfill the needs of another person's soul. Can you imagine that? Putting that on someone. Man, you will tear that relationship apart. So, um, very important for us to say, no, this is huge. I get that, that whole idea of being totally and singularly devoted to Jesus. I get that part. And I receive, here it is, I receive my fulfillment from him. This is what we teach our children. 
I receive my satisfaction and my joy from him. I'm overflowing in my love from Jesus. And I worship him. And now when I enter into a relationship, I enter into that relationship as a whole person. Not a half person who's trying to find my other half. Okay? That's, that's, that's a bad picture. Okay? Oh, where's your cuter half? <laughs> uh, no, no halves. You enter into a relationship whole. You must be whole when you enter into this relationship. If you're, if you're not, you're going to look to that other person and try to meet all your needs, and that person's going to be like, dude, you know, I'm sorry, I can't meet all your needs. I'm just a person, all right? You need to go to God for that. <laughs> so that's the, that's the purpose behind the single season, behind the, celib the celibacy season, and it's to help us to understand where ultimately we get our, our fulfillment from. And then when we enter into a marriage relationship, you'll do that in a healthy way. And as we, I just showed you, um, about 90% plus percent of us are designed for that. Now, um, number two, writing your notes there, the problem is not our desire for marriage. That's not the problem. The problem is our approach. All right? It is how to get from A to Z. It's the way we get there is the problem. So we understand that we have the desire. The issue is what are the steps to get to that? We, I need to go through the steps. Okay. Now, um, when I was a young uh, youth minister, you know, back in the day, that guy you saw a little earlier, um, I was going through a lot of confusion as to how to get there. There was no manual. There was no, in fact, a lot of my other friends, you know, likewise, would just wreck themselves, you know. Uh, you, th you think it's bad now in the 21st century, you know, back in the 80s, it was like just as like uh, confusing. And um, uh, I want us to compare two different approaches. One is correct and the other incorrect. And I, very quickly, let me just kind of tell you a little bit about the non-Christian dating um, approach, the, the history of how this came about, okay? Um, the year is 1896, and the word dating was first introduced into the English vernacular. It actually was originally, originally a synonym for prostitution. That was the original use. We don't use it that way anymore. But that's how, so in 1896, when a man says, I'm looking for a date, uh, you know what he's, what he's looking for, right? So early 1900s, magazines and secular publications began to publish articles for young women preparing them for relationships. So that means that women are no longer being informed only by the family and only by church. Today, you can go to a grocery store and find magazines informing women about relationship techniques. Today, this is where a lot of women get their thoughts from, you know. It's like 10 things you can do in bed to make your man happy, you know. I'm sure one of them is not read your Bible, all right. So, <laughs> that's not on the list, okay. <laughs> so, but... This, this, is, this, is, this is the evolution. This started in the 1900s when magazines started talking about dating outside the context of family and church. By the 1920s, now you have theater, diners, and other social spots that emerge, and the relationship scene is further removed from the home setting. By the 1930s, automobile sales are on the rise. And now more young men are able to pick up women and relate with them in furtherly, further isolated situations outside of the home. Back in the old days, it was like you come over to the house, you greet the parents. Now because of the automobile, you have more movement. You can drive away somewhere. Bad scene. 1940s, men realized the expenses of dating and the trend of sexual favors are introduced by becoming more of an expectation. 
So if you're in a premarital relationship and you remove the physical element from your relationship and it ceases to exist, it, it's, it's almost like a glorified form of prostitution. So, so now you can see kind of where we're going. And then you know what happened in the 1960s if you're like my age. What was that? Sexual revolution. Feminism and the sexual revolution. I want to save some of this for next week because next week you will see how the sexual revolution destroyed society. Destroyed society on so many levels. And one of the things it destroyed was marriage. And you'll see that. In the 1960s, the very first Playboy magazine hits the counters and it reshapes men's expectation and outlook on women. How many of us know that pornography completely corrupts a man's idea of what it means to be in a relationship? That, that, that you know, if, you're, if we've come from the world, you're going to have to like completely cleanse your mind from all the stuff that the 1960s, uh, you know, tried to stick in your head. So now, in the 1970s to present day, we have birth control, legalized abortion, no-fault divorce. All of these have reshaped our culture into a very godless paradigm on sexuality. And so we are going to need to get away from that. Amen? We need to separate ourselves from the hookup, shack up, break up, repeat generation that has been created. You're going to need to say, Lord, I am not going to do that that way. I'm not going to do my life that way. It has destroyed so many people. And so um, uh, we need another approach. Okay? We need another approach. And for the remainder of our time, I want to go through um, what's called the five C's in our church. And uh, even though some of you have heard this before because you're a part of the church plant at New Hope Central Iowa, this is a, an original message. And by the way, um, this is also in my book, God Things. It's chapter 10. Shameless plug. <laughs> uh, so if you, you know, want to get it um, you know, in written form, you can download that on Amazon or, a, or a Kindle and, uh, and get this. But the five C's were something that I, I, I put together a long, long time ago in the 1980s um, after I figured it out and then I wanted to share it with every family and every, everybody in church so they could understand this approach. And um, you might call this um, the preseason, right? So before the football season, right, the actual season, there's the preseason, right? And so every believer, every young man, every young woman uh, on their way to marriage has to complete the preseason. And the heart of this preseason is that you become um, 100% in Jesus, all right? So 100% in your relationship with him and your character with him. So let's kind of go through it. Um, there are five areas in which you want to grow. And let's go ahead and put those up there. And um, the first is your relationship with Christ. And uh, in your relationship with Christ, you want that to be 100%. And I'm not talking just about you um, putting your faith in Jesus, right? So that's number one. It starts with that. First, you need to have a relationship with Jesus. So you put your faith in Jesus, and then what happens is you begin to grow in your character in Jesus. You become Christ-like. And I tell you, the, the, the more intensely we grow in our relationship with Jesus, the more the sexier you become, <laughs> you know, uh, at least to uh, Christian singles. <laughs> so um, this, is, this, is what, uh, this is what we're doing. It's like we're totally focusing on the Lord and saying, Lord, would you make your character my character? I want to shed all this stuff from the world that I picked up, you know, from <laughs> throughout my life. And I just want to be totally, totally yours. Okay, so your relationship with Jesus is, is number one. Growth in character, that's what we're talking about. Let Jesus transform you. And then the next thing is you grow in your calling. So you have to discover your calling. Most, most people don't, don't know what their calling is, but 
I, I want to I propose that you want to know what it is that God has called you to do so that when you get into a relationship, hopefully you go into a relationship with someone who has a similar calling as you. So Mona and I, when we were young, um, we both wanted to be in ministry. We both wanted to serve Jesus. And so I wasn't looking for a relationship. I was like running hard, you know, to, to do ministry and just like serve Jesus. Like especially that one last year was very, very intense on just like reaching out and, you know, just doing ministry, right? And lo and behold, as I'm running hard like this, I look to my right and there she is running hard <laughs> right next to me for Jesus. So you just run hard for Jesus and those that don't want to run hard for Jesus, they'll be way, way back there. You won't, you won't notice them. But those that do want to run hard for Jesus, you look to your right, look to your left, and they'll be right there with you. And those are the ones that you want to, I was going to say hook up, but that's a bad word, right? <laughs> those are the ones that want to, you know, pursue <laughs> in a godly way. All right. So calling. What is your calling? Do you know what it is that God wants you to do? If not... That would be one of the things that I would, I would say. You ask the Lord and say, what, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? This is also very important because the next one is college, okay? Now, I understand not everybody finishes college, and, and uh, you know, um, I'm basically talking about educational goals here, right? But I, I needed a word that started with C. <laughs> so, you know, I put college, you know, and most people, you know, do get college degrees, but it can be your high school degree and maybe you're done with that. That's good. You start working um, and that's awesome. But um, the reason I say seek the Lord about your calling is because then you can ask the Lord, okay, in light of this calling that I have, what college should I go to? And then you can spend money on college. Most people, they just like go to any college, okay, because they got a scholarship or something, you know, but they don't really know what their calling is. But you should, you got to pursue the calling. The calling is the key. And then you can spend the big bucks, right? Um, and that's important because, you know, I know some, and you know, maybe the Rosarios can, you know, can share this testimony as well. And they'll spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on college and end up after college in huge amounts of debt with a degree that you really don't use. Right? Now, you just have to think ahead a little bit. Now, it's okay, it's okay to like, okay, well, that's what I thought at the time. Well, that's fine. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying you don't, you don't want to just be like real whatever, you know, I'm just going to go here because they gave me a scholarship or whatever, you know. No, you want to be very, very prayerful. And sometimes you'll end up like in a Bible college, like say Pac Rim, because that's more your calling, even though you don't have as much scholarship there, but that's really your calling though. See, so you really want to know what the calling is. Lord, what is it that you're calling me to do? And then you spend the big bucks. I told this to my son, Mark. I said, Mark, you graduated from high school now, nothing wrong with Libra Community Church, uh, Libra Community College. Nothing wrong with that. And uh, he goes, what? LCC? Uh, that stands for Last Chance College. I don't like going there. You know. But it also stands for lots of cute chicks. Okay, I'll go there. <laughs> He didn't really want to go there at first, but I said, hey, you know, you know we're not going to spend big bucks on your education until you know what you're doing, right? So Leeward was his school, you know, for the uh, first couple of years, and, and he was just collecting credits, collecting credits, and, you know, inexpensively, you know, at least I could, you know, I could afford that. And then you send you to, you know, when he figured out that he wanted to be in the ministry, and he said, you sure? You know, you sure you want to do this? He goes, yeah, I'm, God's calling me. All right, then we'll send you to Bible college, and you can, we'll spend, you know, a little bit more on that. But not until you're sure. Does that make sense? And we, we do this with, we did this with all of our kids. We didn't just, like, send them to college. We said, what do you sense God is calling you to do? And then we'll send you in that direction. Now, can, can it change? Could you, maybe you didn't know, maybe you weren't sure. Maybe you, say you thought so at the time, but you know, it's a little different now. Yeah, uh, that always happens. But I'm just saying this is a totally worthwhile thing, amen, to know that. But see, can you see, can you see something here? 
Can you see that you got your hands full doing this? How can you be in a relationship? You can't be in a relationship if you're doing this seriously. Because Christ, you, know, you want it, it's 100%, Jesus. Calling and college, 100%. You want that done. Uh, how many of us know that being in a relationship, it will take time. It will take money. It will take emotional energy. Unless you've never been in a relationship, then you don't know what that's like. But it, it costs you everything to be in a relationship. If, if you're serious, if you're, if you're casual, then yeah, you know, just the hookup thing and no emotional attachment. But if you're really serious about a, like a long-term relationship, a commitment for the rest of your life, that, that's, that's going to require a tremendous amount of emotional energy on your part. Now, if you're doing this seriously, you can't be doing that. You can't be doing that, right? I'm just, I'm just saying, unless, of course, you can multitask or something. You're, uh, you know, I don't know. But so this is a conversation that, that we have with our young people. This is what you're putting your energy to. This is what you're focused on. What is it that, um, first of all, your relationship with Christ and your character, calling, what, what, does, he want to, what does he want you to do? Then you, you, you pay the big bucks to go to college. And then you do what? You go to work. Yeah, you go to work. Yeah. Then you go to work. Now, it's possible to get married after the first three, but there's going to be a problem. Money. Money will be a problem. And how many of us know that the number one thing that couples fight about after they get married is money? It will be finances. But a young couple will say, we don't need money. We have love. <laughs> yeah, but love ain't going to buy you a bag of groceries at Costco. You know. Love ain't going to pay the bills. Love ain't going to pay your mortgage. You know, you can't drive love to work. <laughs> you need a car. <laughs> and uh, to have a car means you need registration, you need repair, you need uh, insurance. Wow, I never thought of all that. Yeah, that's right. That's right, exactly. That's why you got me, Dad. See? So this is the conversation that you have. You need to have a solid career. And that career um, should be, you know, it, it, that's going to also cost you. So that's why my mentor was very wise to say, Mike, you're just starting your career as a, in ministry. Why don't you just take one year to invest in that career? Just focus only on that. Don't be in a relationship yet because that's going to be intense. But just focus on your career first. That was very wise. So I was like 23 and Filipino, but I had to focus on my career. You know, it was like a miracle. <laughs> I said, Jesus, with your help, I can do it. <laughs> Take a lot of cold showers, a lot of push-ups, you know. <laughs> I did it. I did it. So the career. And at the end of, the, at the end of my first year, uh, I was not super established, but um, I had some really, really excellent ministry things going on in one year. Um, leadership was starting to develop, and that's when my, um, you know, my mentor brought me in back in the office again and had that other conversation. Green light. Yeah. Okay, and then you begin the courtship process. And this is, like I said, um, the fifth C. And uh, as I was saying, that this is something that you do with your mentor if you have godly spiritual parents, praise God, do this with them. But everything's out in the open. It's talked about. There's nothing secret going on. There's no, like, secret, you know, like, you're what? You know, like, you're, you're, you're getting together with who? You know, none of that kind of stuff. How many of us know that when a child comes into this world, it should be the happiest occasion in your life? Grandma and grandpa should be, like, ecstatic. Parents should be like, thank you, Jesus. And I tell you, when you do this God's way, what a blessing that will be. Amen? What a, what a blessing. It, it won't be like a, a shock, a surprise. Or, should we have an abortion? I, I, you don't want that. You, know, you don't want that. This is, a, uh, this is your grandkid. This is your child that's coming into the world. You want to bring a child into this world with the greatest amount of blessing 
speaking blessing over this child. You don't want to speak abortion over a child. You don't want to speak death over your child. You don't want to speak any of that, even if you're like you're just thinking about it. No, you, you, want, you want to be ready. Amen? And then this is the way, this is the way to do it. So it's very patient. It's kind of slow. It, it, um, it, it's, there's a lot of waiting on the Lord, but it's totally worth it. Now, by contrast, this is how the church wants to do it. But uh, by contrast, the world, this, let me show you the world's graph, okay? Um, this is the you know, hook up, shack up, break up, repeat, okay? <laughs> this is what it looks like. Christ, eh, you know, okay, I go to church every now and then, maybe not, you know, I don't know, I'm not sure. Maybe I might be an atheist, I don't really know. And then calling, really no idea what, what the calling is. I don't know what I'm doing here. College, okay, I'm in college, yeah, sure, I'm good, but... I'm not sure what I'm doing. And then career, no career yet. I have some ideas. But relationship, bam! Oh, yeah, we're like all the way off the chart. We're ready to go. This right here, okay, when you have your conversation with your young people or discussions with your children, this right here is a, is a recipe for disaster. This is disastrous. Okay, you don't have your ducks in a row. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. You don't know your calling. College and career are not complete. You're not at 100% yet or even close. But your courtship thing is like off the charts. This, is, this can be very, very disruptive in your life. You, you watch what this could do in a person's life. It's, uh, it, it's something you want to steer them away from. And so, and as you're doing that, we extend grace, amen. <laughs> um, we extend love and lots of love and lots of forgiveness and uh, just to have, you know, keep your open lines of communication. I'm not saying break lines of communication or, or this is it, you're out of the house now or, you know, that kind of thing. You have to be very discerning because once upon a time, we did not know what we were doing, right? And maybe some of us today are just finding out, oh, wow, that, I, I love this 5C plan. I wish I knew it 20 years ago. Well, we know it today. And so we are, we are able to kind of begin to implement it today. And what I'm saying is that, you know, it's going to be a journey. So do not expect that, uh, you know, we're going to have all this, like, figured out, like, like, right this afternoon. Okay? All right. So those are the five C's. And um, the way it begins, and this is how I want us to, to conclude this morning. Um, the way it begins is with a very intense relationship with Jesus. We start with him. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. So you want to be like a, an awesome uh, husband one day? You want to be an awesome father? Or maybe you want to be an awesome husband like right now. Or awesome father like right now. Awesome mother. Um, the key is, it's like, just like genetics was saying, right? Just focus on him. Say, Lord, my life is completely about you. It really is true. You know, it's interesting because for most of my, as I was saying, Filipino life, I was like looking for a relationship, seeking, seeking, looking, looking, always looking, always checking somebody out, always trying to get to know someone. It was really interesting. It's when I said, Lord, I will seek first your kingdom. I will put you first. I'm not going to look. I'm just going to put you first. And you do in me what you need to do in me. When that happened, the relationship came along. Isn't that interesting? It's so interesting how that works out. And uh, so let's all stand together for closing prayer. And I want to just, uh, just in invite you into this same kind of like intense relationship with Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to say thank you this morning because we look at the world today and it has gone completely crazy. And we're, we're not here sitting in judgment of the world. What we're saying is we just, we, we're just looking for another way instead of hook up, shack up, break up, repeat. God, do you have a plan for us? And thank you this morning for the five C's. And thank you, Lord, that you have a wonderful plan. Excuse me. We have a wonderful plan for every single one of us. 
but it will begin with your grace, your love, and then being super intense about you, incredibly on fire for you, Jesus. So as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and as you're just, you know, listening now to the Holy Spirit, if that is you if you, if you, if you are saying in your heart, Lord, this is how I want to live my life. You first, Jesus. You first. And I believe you're going to provide the rest, provide the other seas, provide the relationship, provide everything if I just put you first. If you're saying, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm done trying to make it happen myself. I can't make it happen. I, I just, I really just want to surrender it all to you. And maybe you've, you know, done something like that before. But, but maybe there's a new understanding of what that means this morning. Just by the uplifted hand, would you say, Lord, that's me. I totally just want to now surrender it all to you. I just want to put you first and very intensely very intensely just keep you at the forefront of my heart and life. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Anybody else? Good. Praise God. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you, God. I want to thank you because you, um, you know us better than we know ourselves. You made us relational. And thank you, God, that the first relationship that you want us to have is one with you. And so, God, we thank you that this morning there's so many that are in their hearts crying out to you for that. And so we bless them, Lord, for that. We bless them to the intense um, beautiful, uh, scary and exciting journey of walking with the one who knows us better than we know ourselves, but also loves us more than we could possibly imagine. And God, I also just want to right now, since I am here, just bless the Haliva campus. Lord, we just like now pray your covering over the church against the forces of the world. I thank you, Lord, that um, you cover us in the shadow of your wing. And so thank you that this is a blessed church and is a blessing to so many. And we just want to pray right now. Would you, would you take the hand of someone to your left and to your right? We want to just lift up everyone right now together. We just pray right now for this one to our left and this one to our right. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, would you just kind of right now touch them in a very, very powerful way. Would healing come, healing of emotional things, physical? Would it also, Lord, um, just intensely powerful um, power, power from your spirit come in the form of love and compassion? For the people here in Haleiwa, for neighbors, Lord, for next door neighbors, for people we're, we're working with, we just lift all of, the, all of them up to you right now. Perhaps you're, you're, you're thinking of someone right now who's not in church, who doesn't know about church, who doesn't know about the Lord. And maybe they're lost in this very thing that we're talking about today. We just want to, would you just like lift them up right now in Jesus' name, we just pray for them. We pray for spouses that are not here, for children that are not here. We pray, Lord, for our neighbors that are not here. We pray, Lord, that you would use this one to our left, use this one to our right, Lord, to reach out to them, but also use someone that we may not expect to also touch our loved ones. We just lift this all up to you, God. We know you have an amazing plan and we hang on to that promise in Jesus name we pray all God's children said amen, amen. say thanks to the Lord would you hallelujah <laughs> praise God let's let's go out and sing all right put your hands together here we go follow along with 
Kuipulani and Team Haleiva. <laughs> your hands formed us, your heart knows us. We were made to glorify you, oh Lord. You are all we need. Teach us your way, show us your grace. 